Hey guys, here we are at Table Talk 3. Now we wade into an issue, a specific issue. We're going to be exploring climate change. And so before we set the table for that conversation that we have at Valley Cruces Conference Center in person and online, what we want to do in this short study session is lay a bit of a biblical framework and foundation for these things, some touchstones within the scriptures that help us get a lay of the land of our relationship with creation. We might call it creation care. Let's dive in to the Bible and see what God has to say about our relationship with earth. So as you know, we are earthlings. You know, it's an interesting word earthling because it almost mirrors the kind of language we find in the scriptures. Adam comes from the word Adama. In other words, he's from the earth. The Hebrew word for Adam, for man or mankind, comes from the word Adama, for soil or earth. It is effectively a play on words such as the English earthling, who is one from the earth. Humanity is dirt man and thus has an intimate and original tie to the earth. And so even in the language of the scriptures and our understanding of human identity here in Genesis chapter 2, we get a sense that God wants us to see our connection to the earth, even in our very title. We're made from the dust and to dust we shall return, right? And so this is a theological resource for us as we understand our relationship to creation. That being said, just because we are from the earth does not mean that we are unique in the creation, the capstone of it. God saved us for last. And in doing so, he gave us a task, a task of keeping the soil. We could think of human vocation as a, one of a gardener. So let's take a look at this, the first job that God gave to humanity. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now that is a key word pair, as we will see. Later on in the Pentateuch, in the book of Numbers, the task, the priestly task of taking care of the, t the tabernacle and, and one day the temple, it's described with the same word pair. Uh, see if you catch it here in Numbers 3.8. They are to take care of all of the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. And so there's this connection between the priestly task and the task of our relationship with the earth. So we could summarize it like this. The Hebrew verbs avad and shamar, that's to work and to keep, are priestly in function, informed in part by the priestly vocation of humanity. We know that we are made in the image and as the likeness of God. And as we see throughout the scriptures, God is concerned with uh, people representing him. That's a priestly task. We see it in Exodus 19. Uh, we see it in Genesis 12. We see it as a golden thread all the way through 1 Peter 2, that uh, the people of God represent him. That's a priestly role, a priestly task. And as we are to understand that, we are to also understand that there's something unique about creation that calls to mind the priestly task. So let's move forward to our next point and see if we can tie this together. There's some very interesting work uh, by some ancient Near Eastern scholars. I'm thinking particularly of John Walton, but he pulls from others. The way that the uh, Genesis 1 account is laid out, Genesis 2, is, is reminiscent of ancient Near Eastern temple building liturgies, these texts that describe the architecture of a temple. There's remarkable similarities between the Genesis account of creation and these temple building texts. So what can we deduce from this? So well, Gordon Wyndham helps us out. Let's check this out. The Garden of Eden is not viewed by the author of Genesis simply as a piece of Mesopotamian farmland, but as an archetypal sanctuary that is a place where God dwells and where man should worship him. Many of the features of the garden may also be found in later sanctuaries, particularly the tabernacle or Jerusalem temple. These parallels suggest that the garden itself is understood as sort of a sanctuary. Uh, John Walton runs with this and many other ideas as he dialogues with different ancient Near Eastern uh, temple building texts and makes these remarkable observations. 
In the Bible and in the ancient Near East, the temple is viewed as a microcosm. The temple is designed with the imagery of the cosmos. The temple is related to the functions of the cosmos. The creation of the temple is parallel to the creation of the cosmos. In the Bible, the cosmos can be viewed as a temple. And this is remarkable. I just want to kind of ruminate over these observations so far, that humans have a special relationship with the earth, that that relationship is one of a priestly task, and that as written in its cultural context, part of the message of Genesis 1 and 2 is to illustrate that all of the cosmos, creation, is the temple of Yahweh, and that what we do in creation on the earth is a priestly task of representing him in his temple. Does that reframe a little bit of our relationship to creation? There actually is an explicit relationship between humanity and the earth. And we see this as a theme throughout the scriptures. Did you know that God views the land as part of the covenant between him and his people? It's a member of the covenant relationship. So following the work of Daniel Block, we could call this a tripartite relationship. God, people, and land, all in a relationship. Let me summarize some thoughts from Daniel Block. Humanity is bound in a tenant-lord-land relationship. In Israel's ancient Near Eastern Malu, this was a transcultural concept. Daniel Block observes this deity-nation-land association tripartite relationship as a key consideration in Israel's corporate standing with God. You can browse through sections of the Bible where the creation is actually called as a witness in the partnership between God and humanity, where creation is called to demonstrate their covenant loyalty or faithfulness. Even the lenses that ecological crisis for ancient Israel was viewed as a feedback mechanism that the sin, the defilement of their place would express itself in natural disasters. And so one way to view the sickness of the planet, if we're going to extrapolate from these biblical concepts, the crisis we find our creation in, the Bible would say that's, that's a theological issue. It's, it's an issue and a fruit of the fallenness of humanity, that creation is in crisis. I want to summarize the work of another theologian, indigenous scholar, Dr. Sukaina. He helps us understand that indeed, this relationship we have with the earth is a spiritual crisis. Indigenous theologian, Dr. Sukaina lists spiritual pollutants that draw consideration. And might I add in this book, he is drawing these directly from the Old Testament. Idolatry, immorality, bloodshed, and broken treaties. Injustices such as these are not just breaches of the human to human and human divine relationship, but acts of defilement upon the land. However strange it is to Western culture, the land is a grieved party from the biblical perspective. If this kind of tripartite relationship is paradigmatic to God's global reign as sovereign Lord of the cosmos, then what has taken place in the biosphere is first and foremost a theological issue. We need to keep this in mind that the idea of the world being in a climate crisis or an, an ecological crisis or a mass extinction crisis, these things aren't ancillary to biblical faith. In fact, the Bible gives us lenses to see that ultimately the diagnosis is the brokenness in the relationship between God and humanity and humanity and humanity and humanity and earth. This comprehensive brokenness means that a comprehensive gospel and a comprehensive approach to redemption, it restores all of these relationships, including the relationship between humanity and the earth. And so this indeed is not a side project, but it's a gospel concern. And yet the Bible stretches out this discontinuity between what will come and what is, what we call a renewed heavens and earth. The Bible's picture of a new heaven and new earth is quite earthy. And what I mean by that, it's renewed and not scrapped. 
we wade here into the tricky field of biblical eschatology. And there's been a lot of misconception on what the Bible teaches about the end game of God's global redemptive plan. But what I want to look here at is a couple of texts that show the discontinuity between what will be that Guys, we can't fix all the earth's problems ourselves. We need to keep this in mind. Biblical eschatology keeps us from becoming too confident in our own abilities to fix things. Because the, there is an old order that won't pass away until Christ comes again. And at the same time, God does not scrap all of what is here. And that in fact, he builds off of it. New Jerusalem descends here on this new heavens and new earth. So let's read some of these texts to inspire us as we reflect and as we close. Isaiah 65, 17. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Let her people be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. Isaiah in this wonderful vision gives us an idea that yes, it's still Jerusalem, but it's transfigured and transformed. And so there's continuity between the places and things that we know today in earth and what God is gonna do in the renewal. We'll also get another vision of this wonderful scene, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The picture here is not of us getting zapped up to some parallel universe, but indeed God bringing heavenly realities onto the earth. And so if, if we've ever sensed that uh, Christian's proper role in creation care is that of evacuation, that we don't need to own these problems and that they're irrelevant to the future, that's not quite the p picture that the Bible paints. The Bible paints a picture of God renewing this earth. And so our vision of the future is embodied and it's very earthy. And so what we do now is indeed a spiritual matter. And so we turn our, our questions into ones of responsibility. What is our responsibility? How are Christians to wade into the issues of climate change, of the way that we respond to ecological crisis? What is our responsibility? What is the ethic that we see from the scriptures? What is the ethic that we, as a body of believers, want to impress upon the world? How do we care for creation as Christians? With these biblical foundations in mind, let's listen to some different perspectives on our relationship with the earth. So if you'll go onto the Table Talk 3 page and scroll down past the link for this video, you'll find a few readings that you can dive into, dialogue with, take notes, disagree with, and bring our thoughts to the table together for our event. I'm really excited. May God bless this endeavor. Godspeed.